Hey friends, I hope you're having a great day. I wanted to take some time to do a response or follow-up video to one that I posted a while back about the realities of hiking and backpacking with dogs. At the time of recording this video, that one has, I think, over 20,000 views, which is just wild to me. I had no idea that it would be such a popular video and that the things I share in it would spark so much conversation. The comments section was just full of folks asking questions and sharing their points of view. And even to this day, I'm still getting comments and conversation on that video on like a weekly basis. So I wanted to take the recurring questions that I saw as well as some criticism and even a few comments that I really appreciated and, and want to highlight. And so we'll go over all of that here today. We'll get started with the criticism. So overall, the comments were incredibly positive. There was no um, rudeness or anyone being just uh, aggressive. That was not the case. So to call this criticism would be very light. Although the majority of the comments were in agreement with our stance, there were still plenty of folks who did not agree that choosing not to have our dogs socialize with other people and other dogs that they encounter was a good thing. They felt that they needed to have those interactions. And I can totally understand where folks are coming from with that but the way that I and my husband view it, it's opening a door to risks that we are not willing to take. So what I mean by this is I can train my dog to respond a certain way and I've chosen to have them ignore and walk past whoever they pass on the trail, but I can't change or have any impact or influence on how other people train their dogs. And so I've had many experiences in the past where I have been assured that somebody's dog is friendly and that was not the case. And it would be pretty detrimental to take somebody's word for that, let the dogs interact, and then there is a fight or an injury and I am miles from the car, from the nearest bailout point, and I have this injured dog that I now need to take care of. That is not a risk I am willing to take. I mentioned in that previous video, our dogs, Barrett and Nora, they get plenty of socialization with other dogs. On just Jordan's side of the family, we're up to, I think, 10 dogs between the various family members. They get tons of time to interact with other dogs. But like I've said, the trail is not the setting in which we do that because we cannot predict or control the behavior of dogs that we may encounter on our walk. Hopefully I explained that well. I'm sure that some folks, nothing I say will change their opinion and that's fine. You're entitled to continue to disagree with me, but that's just where I'm coming from uh, with that decision for our dogs. Before we move on, I want to share a comment that uh, somebody left who is a dog trainer on this subject. They said, I train working dogs, we teach neutrality, which means socialization is not letting strangers touch or interact with them and not allowing strange dogs to greet or approach the dogs, both as puppies and as adults. Dogs being social animals is not quite what most people think it means. Neutrality is essential, micromanaging what a dog is exposed to. You cannot control other people and you cannot control other dogs. If something spooks your dog, you then have to go back and work on something that could have been preventable. If a dog grows up knowing other dogs and people exist, but they're not part of that dog's life, dogs tend to not be over the top about greeting, and on the flip side, they are less likely to have fears or nervousness associated with other people or animals. Of course, breeds and genetics play into the overall success in this, but the concept applies. And so I really appreciated that comment. It pretty much sums up uh, where we're coming from and kind of our stance on it. Now let's get into some of the recurring questions that were left on that video. The first one has to do with our ignore command. We just use leave it. And leave it applies to both 
people, dogs, objects we don't want them interacting with. We didn't do anything particularly special to get them to understand that command other than I guess practicing with stationary non-living things first so whatever is in the yard or in the house that we do not want them interacting with and then once they get the concept of what it means to leave it we kind of broadened it to then apply to people and dogs that we it? pass on the trail and so when we you say leave, leave it, it walk calmly past after they have done it we say good leave it and praise them, reward them, all of that. Another recurring question was, how do you handle resupply and long distance hiking with a dog? So I personally have not gone on a long enough trip with my dogs that resupplying has been necessary. However, there was one person who left just an incredibly helpful comment who has had that experience Unfortunately though, I think they deleted it, which makes me so sad because it just perfectly summed up their strategy and answered the question for so many people. So I'm gonna try to relay as much of it as I can remember and hopefully the person who originally posted it will chime in and reshare their experience with us. But from what I remember with this comment, in order to successfully complete larger sections in which you do need to resupply, but you have a dog because obviously, unless they are a certified service animal, you're not taking them in the grocery store with you. Um, you pretty much have to get in contact with the right trail angels who can help you out in that regard. And oftentimes that does mean paying more to ensure that they can do a resupply drop for you. Um, a food cache, whatever it may be. So overall, the way that they were able to overcome or work around this logistical challenge was by paying folks who were willing to do a little extra for them in terms of shuttle and uh, resupply drops. I've got my baby taking a nap here, so if you see tiny hands and feet in the bottom corner here, that's what's up, that's what's going on. Another question was bears and how do you handle hiking, backpacking, camping with a dog when there's bears out there? Again, I'm going to pull from the comments to answer as well as share from some of my own experience. So I can count on one hand the number of times I have encountered a bear hiking with my dogs. And when I say encountered, I mean they are running the other way, way off in the distance. Uh, so what I have heard just talking to rangers about this is majority of the confrontations between dogs and bears happen when the dog is off leash. So the dog will see the bear and pursue it. And then at some point in the chase, the bear may turn around and chase the dog back and then of course, we know what happens. Dog gets caught by bear and bear is bigger than dog. So majority of those conflicts, attacks, whatever you want to call it, have to do with the dog not being restrained and then starting the altercation with the bear. That's at least what I have been told by rangers uh, in sort of a PSA as to why even at camp, keep your dog on a lead or under restraint. Drawing from the comments, uh, I really liked this one that was shared. This is a month old. It's much older by now. But generally speaking, bears do not like dogs. Like they don't like them at all and will leave the area before you're close to avoid them. Unless you're near a nest or something of that nature. In that case, it's no different than you dealing with the bear and you should have bear spray. Now how your dog reacts is on you and the training that's been provided. I think thousands of years of dealing with them as pack animals is still instinctual. That one means more and to stay away. I agree. Uh, I'm not a bear, so I can't tell you exactly what's going on in their head, but I don't believe that they are going to go out of their way to pursue something that they would recognize as a pack animal. And where there's one, there's probably more. Our next question has to do with tent training. So do you have any advice for a dog who doesn't sleep well on the trail? And 
I offered a little bit of advice, but really, you guys in the comments provided so much helpful information and tips and tricks that have worked for you. So I'm just gonna pull from the top recommendations that I saw. There was a whole lot more, so definitely dive into that sort of uh, series of replies on those comments to get even more tips, tricks, advice. If you're sleeping in a tent on the trail, I highly recommend training settling down in the tent at home before going backpacking. What worked great for us was teaching him to settle and then making sure he was extremely tired before introducing the tent. So having like a settle command and making sure that you have thoroughly trained it into your dog at home and then taking it into the trail setting. Also wearing the dog out, I totally agree, helps to make them more compliant with that settle command and less on edge. The last bit of advice I wanted to highlight along these lines is if you can do it, try camping in the tent in your backyard with your dog a couple of days per week for a couple of months. Also get them an inflatable trail bed and use it for your backyard camping and in the house. I think that's such a great idea, introducing them to the gear they will be using in an unfamiliar setting while they're at home, where they're somewhere comfortable. And so then when the time comes to go to sleep in the tent, they're already comfortable and familiar with that trail bed that you have for them. Also, that's just like tried and true advice, test your gear in the backyard at home. Do some pretend camping trips with your dog to get them used to it at home. Next question has to do with gear damage and preventing it. I'm worried about my dog puncturing gear with their claws. Besides trying to trim the claws, do you have any advice? You and me both, friend. Um, I have had to repair so many sleeping pads and so many sections of tent floor because of the dog's nails. One thing you could try that has sort of helped, it's not foolproof, is we have a special uh, trail blanket for the dogs. It's the Climate Versa packable synthetic blanket and it covers a pretty big surface area. So we throw that over the gear and over exposed areas of the tent floor and that helps a little bit. It makes sure that there's another layer between their claws and the really sensitive sleeping pad and tent floor material. We do have to shake it out and readjust it pretty frequently, but it has worked for the most part in mitigating those accidents with gear. The last question has to do with leashes and trekking poles. How can I hike with my dog while using trekking poles without staying tangled? I personally do not use trekking poles. I've never liked them, but this tip, trick, advice should work all the same. So what I will do is clip my hip belt through the handle of the retractable leash, and then I've got my hand at the ready to hit that button to restrict the leash or uh, take back the slack. So when it comes to trekking poles, if you position the handle of the retractable leash kind of centered near the buckle, you can keep that leash or that line centered between your trekking poles so that it's not to one side where as you are trying to move your hands uh, and also hold a leash it's getting all tangled and wrapped up that could be a possible solution definitely be careful though with that little retractable leash hip belt trick because oh if you don't have good control good. over your dog and they don't heed commands and then they pull Stay. you, you could trip Stay. or fall. Good so uh, just be super careful if you try that trick. That's about all I have for you today. I wanna wrap up by letting you know just how much I appreciate y'all sharing your stories and your experiences hiking with your own dogs. Uh, I just love when you tell me, this is your first trip out with your dog or you're about to do a really big new exciting trip with your dog and then you follow up and let me know how it goes that just always brings a smile to my face there's no one quite like a dog to have as your hiking buddy it's a really unique relationship for sure and so on that note i'll close by sharing a comment that really made me laugh it's not all great once you start bringing your dog out on the trail you can never take a dog free hike because they will smell it on you 
two weeks out, having to deal with that look of betrayal is such a pain in the butt. And it's so true. Anytime the dogs see me loading up my pack or carrying it out to the car, they go ballistic because they know what's about to happen. And there's been a couple times recently where it's been just me and the baby going on trail and that look of, what do you mean I'm not going with you? It's heartbreaking. But we still get out together as a family. That's right, they still get their trail time. But there's no denying that once you start taking them on the trail, it's something that just becomes routine and a part of your life together. So I thank you so much if you watched and commented on that first video. I thank you so much for coming to check out this one. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I can't wait to see you again next time. Tracing my footsteps through the wind Back to a place where I could Maybe you just don't go hiking. No, that's not an option.